I read in the paper yesterday in the Wall Street Journal that the whole world is under fear and bondage and scared to death. But we don't allow, the Holy Ghost here doesn't allow that in Times Square Church. We're not going to live in fear and bondage. <laughs> Hallelujah. Turn to Psalm 37, a prophecy of David. King David gave this prophecy that is so very, very unique and so applicable to the time we live in right now. <clears throat> I, I want to, when you get there, please go to the 16th verse, 16th verse of Psalm 37, the prophetic word of David. Verse 16, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Does that fit you? For the arms, or wealth, that means in Hebrew, for the wealth of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows that the days of the upright, and therein their inheritance shall be forever. And here's my text. For they shall not be ashamed in the evil time, in the days of famine, and that's calamity, they shall not. They shall be satisfied. My text is they. My my message is entitled this morning. God's people will never be ashamed in the time of calamity. I didn't say that. David said it, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, Heavenly Father, these are calamitous times. That's the reality. That's what we face. But we know that you have provided answers. You've provided. Food, you provided truth that can set us free so that we can walk all our lifetime without fear. All our lifetime, no matter what comes, no matter what we face, that we can rest in the Lord and we can proclaim his faithfulness. Now, Lord, touch us to hear this message. Give us ears to hear and give me the anointing to speak what you've laid on my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. This prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes, right now. There comes a time when the, the Old Testament prophet said, there, there comes a time when God raises, rises up. He can no longer take the greed, the covetousness, materialism, and the outright fraud against the poor and the needy. And this is what we have seen coming fulfilled right before our eyes. And I just read it to you. For the arms or the wealth of the wicked shall be broken, and the Lord will uphold the righteous. Just in August, October, the last two weeks especially, eight and a quarter trillion dollars vanished, just vanished within hours. And they say there are trillions more that are going to vanish. And this is what the Bible says. Very clearly, Isaiah said, I've spread out my hands all day to rebellious people who have walked in the way that is not good, a people that provoke me to my face. And I will not sit still. I will repay. God has not been asleep. Nothing has happened other than at his bidding and his hand, God's hand in this. And it has nothing to do with oil. It has nothing to do. It, it's not about the mortgage meltdown. It's much more. It has to do with the glory of God. This has to do completely with the glory and honor of Almighty God. Isaiah, or Ezekiel said, the time has come. The day has arrived. Don't let the buyer rejoice. Don't let the seller mourn. The trumpet was blown, but none went out to battle. Paul the Apostle said there coming a day when there will be very perilous times. Seducers are coming, and those seducers will get worse and worse. Folks, I believe that this fraud, this, this absolute seduction of the poor and the unlearned that were signed up by the millions for houses and for houses that they knew could not be paid, those who had no job, those who had, uh, had no way of repaying the mortgages, and those who signed them up. And the, these were well-known companies. 
uh, countrywide, other major corporations that w were doing this. The executives knew it. Everyone who did it uh, knew that they were cheating, that they were seducing the poor, seducing the unlearned. And, Zach, and Zephaniah, it clearly defines what happened. The fulfillment of Zephaniah 1.9. And they danced on the thresholds of the poor and filled their executive homes. They danced on the threshold, on the homes of the poor. They danced. How clearly that was just a few weeks ago when, when a party, uh, uh, when one of these top mortgage companies, knowing that it was going down, knowing that bankruptcy was coming, held a huge expensive party in a retreat, drinking and dancing all night, dancing on the threshold of the poor. How long did we think God would put up with it? How long did we think that God would put up with all of this madness, the mocking of God's name because God's honor, his name is at stake. The sword has entered their own heart and their bows, bows their wealth shall be broken. In the middle of this, where wealth is vanishing, and God is dealing with the seducers and those who just committed outright fraud, outright covetous fraud. We see the headlines. It's in our headlines every day. It'll be in the headlines all next week. And, folks, there may be a, a short reprieve, but it's getting worse all over the world. Australia and Ireland and now Russia, who invaded, <clears throat> they invaded Georgia, and they made sounds like they were going to bring back all their satellite countries that broke off, and they were becoming belligerent and proud. We are going to be a world power. And you see, God just, just breathes a breath. He just speaks a word, and suddenly all that wealth vanishes. The two richest billionaires are being bailed out now. Their money is just vanishing, trillions of dollars. Their bow shall be broken, we see it. But you see, in the same time, God says, I want you to look at it. It's in the headlines. It's just as sure as this word is being fulfilled, just as sure as I warned you that this was coming, and it has happened. Be just as sure that when I speak good to my people, it's going to happen. You, you measure it. My word is faithful. I'm not just faithful in my woes. I'm faithful in my promises. And this is what David is assuring us of. God's people shall not be ashamed in the time of calamity. The people of God shall never be put to shame. God will never put to shame his people. Isaiah 50, verse 5 and 7. These are the words speaking of Christ himself. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not disobedient. I did not turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me, my cheeks to those who pluck my beard. I did cover my face with humiliation and spitting. I did not cover my face. For the Lord God helps me. This is Christ speaking. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint because I know I shall not be put to shame. God will never put his people to shame. Now, folks, we're going to face impossibilities, absolute impossibilities, just like they did in the Old Testament. Folks, it's going to get so bad, it's going to take a miracle. And every impossibility, God said he's the God of the impossible. And every impossibility demands a miracle. It demands a miracle. There's no other way out. When you, what does the word impossible mean? No clue. No way out. And that we are coming to this, that the glory of God may be exalted. God said, I am going to act to the glory of my own name. I'm going to move. I'm going to act on behalf of my children according to my own Glory, according to my own reputation. God's reputation is at stake. And God willingly puts his reputation in the hands of his people. I used to think, well, uh, God, if, 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 if I did something terrible and uh, I, I had shame on me, uh, 
Your name is so great. You can defend your own name. You don't need me. You don't need what I say or do. You don't need me. You can defend. You can defend your own name. You can defend your own honor. You're a great God. No, you see, God commits himself that we would commit ourselves. He, 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 God allows us to come into impossible situations that demand the faith for the miraculous. We say we believe. We say we testify to the whole world. We, we have Jehovah Jireh. We testify to the whole world that our God has made promises to see us through. But God's going to bring you. He's going to bring me. He's bringing his church into the place where everything humanly is impossible. Only God. I want, I, I've been interested in the past few weeks, uh, almost a month now, going through the Old Testament and testing what I've just told you. That, that God, time after time in the Old Testament, has brought his servants into situations that were humanly impossible to be solved. And how God's honor was at stake. What I'm trying to prove to you, and I'll go through this in just a moment, I'm trying to prove to you that when you commit God to his promises, when you go out on a limb, so to speak, and when you speak and commit God to his own word, God said, I'll never put you to shame. I will never put you to shame. Here is Moses, the Red Sea. Now, these are familiar stories. See how this man commits God. Where, where God, so, God, so, it, it is so clear that if God doesn't come, if God doesn't act, God's purpose, his eternal purpose is destroyed. They're gone. Moses and the children of Israel in a hopeless situation. You know the story. They're in this valley, two mountains on the side, and the Egyptians coming, and the Red Sea in front of them. Impossible. And God is on trial in Egypt. Yes, it's already been announced the Israelites are trapped. That was announced because they saw the army gather, and that army was sent out in jubilation. They're, we're bringing them back, and they're going to come back and change. And I'm sure that they had parades lined up. They had all the people lined up to bring these Israelites back in chains. You see, God's honor is at stake in Egypt. God's word is on trial, and God is on trial. What if God doesn't show up? Here is Moses, and he's looking at this situation, and he is told the night before, go, <clears throat> the waters are going to open, they're going to pile up on both sides. So here comes this man. He stands before the people in an absolute hopeless situation, and he says, move on. And I'll tell you, God is on trial with Israel as well. This, this word, go on. What, where is, what kind of faith is this? What kind of thing that, that, that a man can say, I, I so believe God. I so believe that his promises are true. And what the word I've received, I'm going to act on it. And he speaks into the face of that impossibility. And he says, God is going to come. God is going to do a miracle. We're going through. You see, he put God to, I don't want to say he put him to test. He goes out on a limb. Because you see, what happens if God doesn't show up? Then Israel is finished. They will never again believe God. They will never because and you see, this is, this is what happened at the cross. They, they look at him bleeding, dying. And he, so he boasted, he committed his God, that his God was going to deliver him. And look at him now, he's, he's bleeding to death. If, if your word is true, if you've really committed the Father to, to save you and to deliver you. All right, let's watch. And they wait, they, they wait for that moment of, that God's man will be put to shame. And what Jesus said, yes, I took this money and took it all, but I knew something. My father would never fail me. My father would never put me to shame. And the cross was not the same. There are times when it looks like uh, God has not shown them, but it looks like there's shame and, and despair. But God said the story isn't told. When the story has been told, those who commit themselves, everything, live or die. God's honor is at stake, not my honor. 
My honor is not at stake. Moses is not wanting to be uh, uh, looked at as a prophet. He's not building his own reputation. He's committing God. You have a situation today. Have you committed God yet? Have you taken your faith out into the distant unknown? Where you say, God, only a miracle. And you've got to hold on for that miracle. You can't look for another way. You can't sit around figuring it out. You can't go to your friends and find. You get a word from God and you stand on that promise. With God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. I was thinking of Joshua. They, they've already marched around for seven days, and it's the seventh day. And, and th- these wonderful people, so faithful to their pastor, and he, he says, I've got a word from the Lord. Seven times today, on the seventh march, the walls are going to tumble down. Think of it. I said, think about it. What kind of faith is this? What kind of a committing of God to his word? He said, the walls are going to come down. And look at all of the people on the walls laughing at these poor people. And and think, I don't know what they want, but they're fools. And if God doesn't show up, he's going to be the biggest fool known. He's going to be a fool. But you see, he's not considered, he's not considering that at all. He says, I know God is able and I know what I heard and I'm going to speak it. No matter the consequences, I'm going to speak it. I believe those walls are coming down because God will never put his people to shame. And those walls came tumbling down. What a commitment. I was thinking of uh, another, Daniel. Daniel. Or rather, in Daniel, three Hebrew children. What a commitment they made. You know, the king had built this 90-foot golden idol. All were commanded to bow. And and folks, God brought him quite a witnessing. Uh, He brought quite a crowd. Princes and governors and leaders of all the known world that had been conquered by this king. And they're there to celebrate uh, this idol. These are witnesses to the glory of God. And the fire is heated seven times over. And the men who are stoking the fire drop dead. And that, that, that multitude must have shuddered when they saw these three young men stand up to this mighty king and say, Okay, we're not going to bow. And he says, you're going into that furnace. And they said, well, we know our God. We know he's able. But if not, we're not going to bow to you. Can can you imagine that crowd watching the people as, as those young men commit themselves into the hand of God for a miracle? They expected a miracle. They believed that. But if not, I'm going, to, I'm going to still not give in to the spirit of this age. And, of course, you know God showed up on the scene. And the king goes in and he sees four men. He said, didn't we throw three? There's four in there. You see, God shows up. I said, God shows up. <laughs> because you're not letting his skill be put to shame. Jesus didn't appear in that furnace to impress the king. He'd already done that. That lasted a week. See, to the ungodly, hardened spirit, uh, miracles, great miracles, impress for a week, a few days. No, see, he didn't show up there for the sake of the crowd. Jesus didn't sit there and say, uh, brothers, I, I came that your testimony would be certified before this multitude. No, Jesus showed up to comfort and bless and commune with them. They'd already been challenged by the Lord of hosts. And folks, when you commit everything you have to the promise of God, now you've got to know them to claim them. 
I said, you have to know them to comp- to and, and God has special promises, unique for everyone. The promises he give may not be yours. I, I have claimed mine. I'm standing on it. There are some things I'm facing in my life, and my family has to do with health and other issues. And I, I, I am looking at it, and I'm saying, and, and God keeps saying to me, do you really believe what you preach? Do you believe what you testify? You testify to the world of all these things, and now uh, are you going to go out in faith and stand by it and believe it no matter what happens? Commit yourself to it. No matter what you see, no matter if there are evidences at all, you take your stand. You look at what is impossible and you say, God, I believe you and get a word from God. And everyone I preached last week has to have their own word. And everything you hear will only, if it's of the Holy Spirit, will drive you to the word. It will woo you to the word of God so that you can hear your own voice in case a church like this in the calamity is shut down for a month or so. And you can't reach other people and and uh, there may not be some phone service. And who do you turn to? You turn to to the Holy One of Israel. You turn to Him who David turned and inquire of the Lord. We're trying to build you up. Your faith is being built up so that you can believe. Expect the impossible. Expect it. That is the human case. That's the human reality we face. But there has to be something implanted in you now that I am going to go further than I've ever gone in my faith. I don't know how to get there, but I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to give me the kind of faith that can look any fear in the eye, can look any issue, every impossibility, and say, God, I stand on your word. You promised to deliver me, and your glory is at stake. Your honor is at stake. God's honor was at stake in every one of these instances. Hezekiah, Jerusalem is surrounded by the Assyrian army, hundreds of thousands of soldiers. They've already taken Samaria and many of the cities in Judah. And the ambassador of the army stands there taunting uh, Hezekiah and, and those who had flooded into Jerusalem, all of the uh, people that was, were, were fleeing the Assyrian army. And he goes to the Lord, and God sends Isaiah to Hezekiah. And this is an impossible situation. They're about to put their their forces into the wall, climb, and invade and overtake the city of Jerusalem. There there would be multitudes, multitudes uh, devastated and decimated. The word of the Lord comes to Isaiah. And there's, here is another committing of God to his word. Committing God where, 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 where God's own honor is at stake. He's made a promise and I have claimed that promise and I've received the word from you. And Lord, I'm going to put your name out there. I'm going to put your honor on the line. You see, my honor doesn't matter. I can go out if I'm in shame and hide somewhere in a wilderness. But your honor is at stake. The future of your divine purposes are at stake. And this is what Isaiah said. Tell him he's not going to shoot a single arrow into this city. He's not going to set a foot in this city. And you tell him that God's going to turn him around and send him home the way he came. Now, God. God is on trial. All, all, all of those, are, all, all this army, and folks, they, this was the greatest army in the, that uh, known time. The greatest army on earth. Everybody had been conquered, and this is an absolute impossibility. And in the middle of that impossibility, when it looked like there was no hope, a word comes from God. I thank God for the privilege of doing what David did at Ziglag to pull myself apart and choir of the Lord and wait until God speaks. And then when I have, I, I'll, it may be a seed of faith, but I'm going to stretch out. I'm going to reach out for the impossible. Now, folks, in this day and age, that is the only hope. 
that you and I are going to have to be saved by miracles. The church survives by miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. All through the Old Testament, everything, they survived. The purposes of God, the plan of God survived. The honor of God, everything that Christ was going to come to the earth and die for. Everything is at stake. And at that night, you know, you will never figure out how God's going to deliver you. You don't know the method. We, uh, if we had a sheet of paper, I, I mean, little pieces of paper, we give everybody a pencil and a l- little card and, and say, would, would you please lay down somehow that God could get you out of your mess? How you have financial problems, you, you have family problems, all these problems. Would you please put down uh, so we can just Pray over your card until God hears the way. <laughs> and folks, I don't care if there were a million people in this room, not one of them would hit God's plan. He, he, he is so marvelous. And he sends one angel. And I don't know how, what, suddenly 185,000 soldiers die mysteriously. They just drop dead. God showed up because he never puts his trusting people to shame. A New Testament example. Peter and John are going to the temple and there sits a beggar. Never walked in his life. And a crowd is thronging into the temple and Peter and John stop. And John must have stopped the crowd and right immediately the crowd must have stopped moving. Silver and gold we have none, but in the name of Jesus Christ we serve, get up and walk. Now, folks, if that isn't a crowd getter, <laughs> Peter puts God on trial. God, Peter commits himself to a miracle and all these people standing around saying, what a fool, what a fool. Walk, he's never walked. We've been coming here for years and that man's been there. He's never taken a step. And then what, how many oohs and alls, how many people looking at each other and, and I don't care what kind of response it was because he's wiggling his ankle. This thing didn't happen just so he didn't just jump up. He had to, he, he had to get some energy in his limbs and he's moving and, and then he's up and he pushes himself up. You see, what if God hadn't showed up? What would have happened to the testimony of the cross, the victory of the cross? What would have happened to God's eternal purposes? What would have happened when all of these disbelievers Go into the temple and the word spreads to the, to the then, uh, Holy Ghost filled church. Uh, Peter told a man to stand up and God didn't keep his word. God didn't show up. God didn't show up. No, you see, God's honor is at stake. And this is, I want to tell you, this has built up my faith more than anything else I've ever learned in the scripture as far as building my faith. You see, we as pastors face the same issues you're facing. We're not in a different world. We're all, we're all going through the fires. This, this is God's hand. This is God's work. And just as sure as he allowed Israel to come into that impossible place, just as sure as God allowed the Assyrians to come to be his rod, just as sure as all of these things happened as they did in the Old Testament, we are being brought into a situation where God is going to have to have a people that really believe him for the impossible. And this has helped me to realize that when I pray and I go into this realm of believing for not just answers to prayer, but miracles, and folks, this, this is what is missing in the church of Jesus Christ. 
those who are willing to commit themselves and truly believe for a miracle, an absolute miracle, so that we, we can rest in the Lord. How can you rest unless you know that every impossible thing is coming into your life and you trust him and you, you, you commit him to his word. You hold him to his word and you commit on that. God is going to answer. Sometimes the answer doesn't come immediately. But God moved the moment you said it. He started that miracle. And now he says, wait patiently after you've done the will of the Father. Just patiently wait. You don't have to figure it out. Believe it and stand on it. You may even die before you see the answer. But if you're in a crisis and you need a miracle and you need deliverance, you need food on your table, you need protection for your children, there are needs that, that have to have an answer by miracle. Are you going to believe God? Will you commit to that? God is, his honor is at stake in keeping his Jehovah Jireh promises to you and to me. He's committed himself. Will you commit him? You're, are you getting any of this? <laughs> Ezekiel 20, verse 14. I acted for the sake of my own name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations before whose sight I brought you out. I want you to read it again. Listen slowly. I'll speak slowly. I acted for the sake of my own name, for the honor of my own name. That's why I acted. Not just to answer you, but my name is at stake. My honor is at stake that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations before, oh, I love this, before whose sight I brought you out. I didn't do this in a corner, and God's not going to deliver you and me in a corner. He, he said, look, I saved you before the crowd. I saved you. Everybody you work with, everybody you know in your circle, your family, I saved you out of your sin. I saved you out of your misery, and I did it in front of the crowd. I did it before the people. And God says, I'm going to act for you. I'm going to answer your faith. Because my name is at stake. My honor is at stake. And I'm going to do it. Just as I've delivered you from sin in front of the multitudes, I'm going to keep my word and I'm going to deliver you and work a miracle for you. In front of your enemies, in front of every demon in hell, in all your family, I'm going to do a miracle. The Bible says the Lord has purposed to stain all the pride and all the glory of this world. And bring it into contempt, all the honorable of the earth. And that's what he's doing. He's bringing down pride. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down. The haughtiness shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. God said they're going to cast their silver and gold to the streets because of the fear of the Lord. And for the glory of his majesty when he rises up to shake the earth. It all has to do with the glory of God. The majesty of God. Those who've been asleep in the church. Those Laodicean lukewarmers. The Lord is going to wake them up. That's what is happening. His honor. His church. This is all about his church. All about his glory. All of those who are preaching the gospel of wealth and prosperity are trembling their knees are trembling because you see God speaks and says, I don't have to send a storm. I'm just going to breathe and cut off the money supply. And folks, I, I, I get letters and people say, what's going to happen to so-and-so and so-and-so? And God is so soft in my heart and said, God, love, I pray for all of God. God says, I'm going to purge all of this out of my church. And out of this is going to come people, the, the right preaching of miracles. Not for $10, not for an offering that you give, 
Not for that at all. No, and all of this disunity in the church, the Baptist, Methodist. Folks, when you're hungry, it doesn't matter where you're Pentecostal, Baptist, or who you are. You're going to go to your neighbor and you're going to give and you're going to receive. God's going to tear down all the walls. They're coming down because his glory and his honor is at stake. Will you stand? Oh, God. You can be trusted. (laughs) Hallelujah. You can be trusted. Would you lift your hands, both hands, and will you just start praising God that he's going to do the miraculous for his church, for your Christian neighbors, and for your family? Lord, I believe. Take us out now, Lord. Take us out of our little realm. Take us away from our unbelief and our fears. Let us believe you for the impossible. Praise him. Just praise him. Some of you, many of you are going through very, very, very troubling time, maybe mentally, physically, spiritually. Will you really hold a faith before you walk out of this church? Will you look back over God's faithfulness over the years? How many times has God shown up? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very, very soon, you're going to have to walk this kind of walk. So will I. I'm going to have to walk. And the just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. (laughs) Pastors and elders, I really believe that the reason God is just putting a mantle of peace and rest on this congregation. And no matter how dark things get, I believe this will be a refuge because it will be a house of faith. Because you will be, you'll be known to speak it. Speak right into the, speak it in Jesus' name. I have, I have an issue about a, a friend on health, dire issue. And uh, <clears throat> I can't speak his miracle into being. I can pray with him and believe God. But I believe God heard me the first time that I stepped out in faith and said, I believe a miracle. And God said, all right, you have to let the plan in my hands. In my hands. And I have prayed for one of the greatest miracles of all, that all my family, all my children, grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren coming, two of them, the twins. I prayed and took a step of faith for years. I believe in a miracle God. No divorce, no suicide, and every one of them walking with Jesus. And the Lord says, all right, I heard you, answered, 
but you're going to have to bear the suffering because there may be one or two that the only way I can bring them to glory is through the fire. I have to do it this way. But I'm, I, I know that I know that I know God's heard me and the miracle is mine. God, I, I'm going to... Glory to God. Lay hold of your miracle today. Now, just one invitation short. If you're here this morning, balcony, main floor, and in the annexes, and you have, you've, you came into this meeting this morning overwhelmed, this is the word the Holy Spirit gives me, overwhelmed, just totally overwhelmed. I, I'm not going to try to describe what is the cause of that overwhelming, but you need a friend. You need friends. You need the prayers of the saints. The two or three agree together for any one thing that shall be done of the Father in heaven. And some of you need, you needed to be here among friends. We're your friends, and Jesus is here. His spirit is moving. I, I want to see the healing. Now, I know this is opens up so that almost everybody could come, but I, I don't want you to come unless you're, you, you came this morning. You're totally totally overwhelmed. You say, Brother Dave, I, I just am overwhelmed. I want you to get out of your seat and come here. We're going to pray. The whole body is going to pray for you. Please don't come just if you have a headache. <laughs> well, we're praying for you anyhow. We'll pray for you. We'll include that. But just say, look, I'm overwhelmed. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. In the annex, I believe we'll have room for you. I'm just waiting to see what the response is. Uh, you, you can go to the... <clears throat> just turn around and go to the lobby, second floor lobby. The ushers will give you direction to come. You can come down to this area. We'll wait for you just a few moments. Then we'll have the body pray together. If you don't know Christ, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know how... If, if you're not communing with him, if you're not in touch with Jesus and you've grown cold or weary or, or you've never, you, you just walked in here today and said, well, there's something here that I want. There's something here that's different. Well, what it is, is that the hearts have been open to the love of Christ for forgiveness. And that can happen to you right now as we worship together. Step up. Mr. Kamoy, speak. I'm reading from the 55th Psalm. I ask the Holy Spirit to give me a word for you. And this is, <clears throat> I talked about those being overwhelmed. My heart is terribly pained in me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. There's fearfulness and trembling that have come upon me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And I said, oh, I wish I had wings like a dove, for then I'd fly away and be at rest. And here's God's reply. As for me, I will call. Here, here's the direction. As for me, I will call upon God. The Lord will save me. Evening, morning, and at noon, I'm going to pray and cry out, and he shall hear my voice. He, Lord, you have delivered me, my soul, in peace from the battle that's against me for their many standing with me. We're standing with you today. He knows how sore pain your heart is. He knows your wound. And the church is going to pray for you and we'll pray. If you don't know Christ, all you have to do is call upon him. Call upon him. And folks, you that have come forward and then in the church too, the, on, on Thursday night especially, this time of prayer and fasting, that, that's so very, very, very vital. But it's also important that morning, night, and noon, there are times of the day where you're at your desk, wherever you're at, to just call out and whisper to him. Call out. Don't neglect him. And draw nigh to him throughout the day. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for drawing me, for speaking to me. Cleanse me, Jesus. Forgive me for all my unbelief 
And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to put in me the very faith of Christ, the faith that he had for the Father. Give me that kind of faith. Lord Jesus, I need a miracle. And I'm asking you for this miracle. And I say it. God will make a way. God will come. God will deliver. Now let me pray. Lord Jesus, how good you are. How faithful you are. How you love your people. How you love those even bound by sin. Those who are discouraged and downhearted. You are a friend and you are a father. Oh, blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord, for coming to our hearts. Thank you. We serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. Nothing. Not anything we could think of. God is able. God is able.